All right, well, I think it's about time to begin. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Joel Dice. This is uh, Joe. Uh, we're here to talk to you about WASI Cloud Core, which is a uh, set of specifications, a set of worlds, if you will, to use the WIT terminology, to uh, allow applications to target a native cloud environment. Uh, and if you attended Brendan Burns' keynote this morning, uh, you can probably heard some of the rationale for that, but the basic idea here is uh, cloud applications don't necessarily want to deal with traditional operating system sorts of interfaces, such as low-level file system calls and environment variables and so on. Uh, instead, they want to deal with high-level concepts such as key value stores, uh, messaging queues, and uh, HTTP, uh, and so on. Uh, so we're going to uh, use the SPIN open source project as a showcase for an implementation of WASI Cloud Core and talk a bit about the motivation behind it, as well as the potential for making this a portable platform that could be run uh, on a variety of infrastructure, uh, cloud providers, service providers, and so on. So like I said, my name is Joel. Uh, I'm not really on social media, so you can just email me, or you could probably catch me on uh, the Bytecode Alliance Zulip if you have a quick question. Uh, always happy to, to, to chat. Uh, I am the principal engineer, or a principal engineer at Fermion. Been there for about a year. Uh, primarily, my focus has been working on improving uh, programming language support, uh, making WebAssembly more truly polyglot. Um, and uh, also working on a lot of other things, trying to help get WASI Preview 2 shipped, uh, and then also help with this, uh, this Cloud Core standard. Uh, I've uh, implemented uh, WASI, parts of WASI messaging and uh, WASI HTTP, uh, and uh, the good news is it was pretty easy to implement. Uh, and uh, some of my hobbies are bike packing, which if you don't know what that is, it's like backpacking, except there's more crashes. Uh, I've, Actually, that's what some of this, uh, you know, little scar is uh, is there, uh, and then wrestling with my two boys, uh, which are very cute uh, and also kind of rough when you get in the ring with them. Uh, and here's hey, Joe. My name is Joe. Hey everyone, um, software engineer at Microsoft, and you know Microsoft is pretty huge. I'm working under Azure Container Upstream and. I work on various open source projects under a back alliance in CNCF Container D and others. Um, I'm a programming language enthusiastic. Um, I really love the functional programming paradigm that exists in some programming languages like Haskell and Rust. Besides work, I love playing video games, I uh, love skiing with friends, and lifting weights against gravity. <laughs> All right, today's talk uh, is going to split into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about what is WASI Cloud Core and why. And then I'll hand off to Joe to talk about Spin. And in the end, uh, if we still have time, we'll do a demo of Spin running WASI Cloud Core capabilities. To motivate things, I want to first talk about monolithic applications. Uh, it's a pretty popular uh, paradigm of programming models that uh, Google and Meta are still using today. Um, one characteristic of monolithic applications are they are typically developed in a single runtime in a family, single family of languages. An example would be Java Virtual Machine and applications written in Java. So applications need a lot of um, common um, capabilities to do like state management, networking, error handling, logging, telemetry, and for detection and recovery from faults, and connecting to external services. One consequence of application developing in a single runtime is that they have to use those libraries and SDKs from this single language ecosystem. Um, and the result of that is those libraries are tightly integrated with the core business logic of the applications. Moving on to more uh, cloud-native ecosystem, and there are some tendencies that these two application features are 
moving to the platform level. So nowadays, we have like a strong sense of separation of uh, application developers and platform engineers. A lot of the application offsite, like packaging, deployment, health check, for detection recovery are being automated by orchestrators like Kubernetes and containers. Applications are required to run on different platforms, OSs, and CPU architectures. Uh, if you ask me like five or six years ago, like Linux, Linux containers are mostly compiled to you know, running on x86, but today, when we package applications to containers, we want to build them in this cross-platform manner. Uh, there is also a stronger security requirement for cloud-native applications. So what can WASM provide in this sense? Well, if you went to Luke Wagner's talk yesterday of what is component Y, he kind of summarized three characteristics or advantage of WASM to provide to accelerate this cloud-native tendencies. One is language neutrality. You can write to your services in whatever language that that can compile to WASM. Second is sandbox support, so you can securely run your applications. And three is linkable modules. That means you can link to modules and to allow them to communicate with each other. Well, you probably will ask, what about containers? Well, containers give you language neutrality. You can package your application in whatever language into a container and deploy to the production environment. Uh, container also use Linux kernel features like cgroups and seccom to give you sandbox support. Containers can also be composed together, um, like Kubernetes. Well, I would argue that containers Kubernetes do a great job on the application lifecycle management and automating a lot of operation stuff like scaling, deployment, networking, for detection recovery, and much more. But inside of containers, you still write your application that use a language-specific uh, SDKs or libraries to do data plan operations. For example, accessing to a key value store like Redis, or listening to events from uh, Apache Kafka. So I'd like to shift focus to, uh, I'd like to go back to the year of 2004, and there is a paper coming from Google. It's called MapReduce. MapReduce is a very classic and famous programming model that allow you to do large data processing on a cluster of hundreds of thousands of machines. What I found interesting or fascinating about MapReduce is that it gave user two simple APIs, a map function and a reduce function to implement. Once you implement those two simple functions, it spawns a huge distributed systems to process a lot of data um, in Google to, to just uh, process large data. So in this particular example, I have a map function that takes a document name and document contents and scan each word in that document and emit one for that word. In the reduce function, it takes a word and all of those emitted ones as a list of values or iterator of values and sum them up. So that gives you the number of occurrences of the word um, in all of the documents. So this is a distributed word count program. What if we can abstract common distributed application capabilities into interfaces that are as simple as MapReduce and as powerful too? Well, first, we need to define what common distributed application capability. What do we mean by common? I would argue common means we can satisfy 80% of application needs. And from the experience of building applications, cloud-native applications, we need things like accessing to key value stores for durability, exchanging events through messaging brokers, uploading files to blob storage, doing inbound and outbound HTTP requests, listen to a key change in conf runtime configurations, and some locking mechanism to for critical path of your transactions, and maybe more. So 
let's dive into one thing in that list of common capabilities. I'd like to talk more about key value store. We want to find MapReduce APIs for key value store, but there are so many key value store out there and each one of them has their own flavor or unique sets of features. For example, memcached is commonly used as a caching layer and we have uh, cloud providers like Azure Cosmos DB and Amazon DynamoDB, we have NoSQL databases like MongoDB and Cassandra. So in order to find an API set that works for lots of the key value stores, we need to find the minimum set of APIs that every single key value store implements. And at the same time, it's going to be useful for application developers. So I believe a simple interface like rewrite that give you get, set, delete, and exist functions is pretty useful. You can use those functions to access your key value store, retrieve a value given a key or set a key value pair. And this interface can be implemented by all of those key value stores mentioned before. And that gave us a decoupled decouple business logic pr from platform concerns because now key value stores are provided by the platform. It's out of the concern of your application developers doing, you know, implementing core business logic. So that makes your business logic more portable, simpler, has less dependencies, and more modular. Well, you may say this idea is not new. We have sidecar containers and there are popular runtime framework like Dapper is already doing this. In sidecar container, we have uh, the business logic is doing a request into the sidecar container, and the sidecar container is going to take care of the job to access to a key value store. In this case, we can lean into Wizen's linkable modules to provide better performance. Instead of doing a full stack networking call, from the business logic into a sidecar container. What we can do is a cheap function call from your business logic that compiled to WASM and which compose or link it to YZ key value interface that's provided by a, a, compo a guest component or provided by the host platform. All right, so we think this idea is pretty useful and we go through each every other capabilities that I listed before, and we standardize all of the, the capabilities like YZ key value, YZ blob storage, YZ messaging, SQL, under the YZ, um, under the WebAssembly organization, W3C. And then we think we can bundle all of them together to create a cloud core world that targets serverless functions. And so we come up with this proposal on the WASI, and you can check out the proposal in this QR code. Okay, what's the trade-off here? What, what's the cost when you use WASI Cloud Core? I think there is a fundamental trade-off between portability and feature richness. If I draw a diagram where the y-axis is portability, the higher you go, the more portable your application is, and uh, access being the feature richness, there might be a curve like this. And I think if we draw dots on that curve, there is a left side dot called YZHP proxy. It's a very simple interface that allows you to uh, handle incoming and outbound HP requests. So application targeting this world is extremely portable. It can port from your local environment, to cloud environment, to edge environment. At the cost of, you know, it's a minimum API set, so you don't get too many features. Well, on the other side, if you use a specific provider like AWS or Azure, you get all the powerful features from the cloud that provides, but you can't port it from one cloud to another. But I think there is a sweet spot in the middle. Why is it called core? that gives you 80% um, of the features that you need in your application, while at the same time being portable, you can port from one cloud to the other. 
And this idea, um, as I said, is not new. Dapper is standardizing the API for common distributed applications in a special interest group called SIG API. And we are happy to announce that we are working with the Dapper team to standardize the APIs in the community so that we can do, we can unify the APIs. At the same time, we can do interoperate between YZ Cloud Core and Dapper. We are also working with external implementers to push in the proposal forward. At the requirement of phase two, we need to work with implementers to prototype and refine the design. And eventually, when we reach the stable version of YZ Cloud Core, we need at least two production-ready um, external implementers. Early this year, at WASN.io, my colleague Dan and Bailey from Cosmonic did a talk about WASN, CNCF WASN Cloud with um, implementing YZ Cloud Core capabilities. In the last few months, I'm working with the Fermion team to bring YC Cloud Core capabilities into Spin. So now I'm going to hand it off to Joe to talk more about Spin. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Spin is, uh, why it exists, and how it's relevant to YC Cloud Core. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that it's, in a nutshell, it's a tool for building and running event-driven microservices. So think functions as a service, um, uh, my, uh, you know, serverless types of workloads, uh, and not just uh, handle events, but essentially use a, a fairly rich set of functionality such as key value stores, uh, SQL, uh, messaging, pub sub, that sort of thing. Um, and so, as you might imagine, uh, YZ Cloud Core is of great interest to us. Uh, it's built on, built on Wasm Time, which uh, has a really interesting set of features uh, for optimizing uh, for you know, low startup latency uh, and uh, quick switching between uh, multi-tenant workloads. Uh, it's entirely open source. It's got an open process. We uh, use uh, spin uh, improvement proposals uh, from the community and, 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 and from Fermion uh, to, to move the project forward. Uh, so it's not just the, your typical corporate throw code over the wall type of thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's a true community. Uh, and it's also both internally modular in the sense that you can plug host components in uh, as desired and uh, extensible via plugins, which can be either native, written in any language, uh, or written in WebAssembly itself. Um, so why would we have chosen WebAssembly uh, to, to, to run a service like this? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a variety of reasons, and it turns out that WebAssembly, a lot of the reasons why WebAssembly is such a good fit for a web browser uh, also make a good fit for a multi-tenant cloud, cloud uh, scenario. Uh, the first, of course, is security. Um, uh, each request that comes in uh, to spin is handled by uh, its own instance, uh, which is isolated from all other concurrent or uh, prior or, or subsequent requests. And not only that, with the component model support that was introduced in SPIN 1.1 uh, experimentally, uh, we now have the uh, per-component, sub-component uh, uh, sandboxing that Luke talked about yesterday. Uh, and so the idea there is that if you have sensitive information, you can uh, ensure that only a subset of your code actually has access to that information, and third-party dependencies uh, are verifiably not able to access it. Uh, another big reason, again, inspired by the, the browser use case, is portability. Um, it's platform agnostic. We've, we talk about that to death, but it's really important. Uh, it also means the development experience is a lot smoother, especially if you're not on a Linux platform uh, on your laptop or what have you. Uh, there's no VM uh, to manage. There's no uh, overhead uh, in running a WebAssembly workload, uh, at least not at the scale of a, a virtual machine running a whole other kernel. Um, and then performance uh, is a big deal. Uh, being able to pre-initialize these modules or, and or components uh, results in sub-millisecond startup times. And I think it, there's a relationship between these two things, portability and performance. Hypothetically, you could write a state snapshotting tool for a native process, say a Linux process running on x86. It would take a lot of work. You could do it. And then it would only work on Linux on x86. And then you'd have to do it again for Windows on 
uh, on x86, and again for Mac on ARM, and so on and so forth. And none of the products of these snapshots would be runnable on other platforms. Uh, and so eventually, you'd probably throw up your hands and say it's not worth it. Whereas with WebAssembly, literally, I did one of the, implemented one of these pre-initializers in an afternoon. Wasn't that difficult. So performance, big, big deal, portability. And then finally, related to performance, cost efficiency. Uh, one of our big theses uh, uh, at Fermion is that we can deliver serverless uh, computing features at lower cost uh, uh, through, uh, and, and uh, that tends to be a result of this quick startup and tear down uh, 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 experience that you have with WASM time. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll kind of go into what I mean by this. And the analogy I sometimes use here is a utility company that's providing electricity to customers. If you had a utility company that only had a handful of customers, they would have a really hard time delivering power efficiently because the load would be so variable, right? You know, as soon as customer A turns on, uh, you know, their air conditioning, suddenly you're, you're, you've doubled the amount of load and spinning up a steam turbine is, uh, you know, not what you want to do frequently. Uh, and so having a small number of customers would make it really hard to uh, both handle the peak load, but also uh, minimize the gap between that and the average load. And that's kind of what we see here il illustrated. The, the, dot, the dash line at the bottom or near the, in the middle there is the average load, but you see it's a big gap between that and the peak load uh, at the, w when all the peaks of these uh, uh, resource usage uh, is come, uh, kind of correspond. Um, that's in contrast when if you uh, increase the number of tenants, just even add in a couple more tenants here, Start, you start to see that gap close. Uh, and that's really important for uh, ensuring that you are providing the amount of capacity that's appropriate to the workload. The smaller that gap is, and that gap indeed will, assuming you have a lot of uncorrelated diverse workloads, will continue to, to shrink. And thus, you're utilizing the resources, your hardware, your electricity, et cetera, uh, more efficiently than you did in the, uh, you know, in the, in the less multi-tenant scenario. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, the, maybe the question, or this is an obvious question to people, but why uh, WASI Cloud Core and SPIN? Well, like I said, SPIN already has been providing from day one these uh, elements of functionality, but at the time there wasn't, at least in the WASM world, a standard for expressing these things. And so you tended to have to uh, use SPIN to target SPIN, but now the, the vision is that you can use SPIN or another tool to target SPIN or another tool that provides these same interfaces. Uh, and then just a few more things about SPIN. Uh, the language support, uh, this is something I'm passionate about. Uh, I'll be giving a talk about Python later today. Uh, we fully support uh, Rust and Go. We have pretty mature, but still technically experimental support for TypeScript, Java, JavaScript, uh, Python, and .NET. Uh, we're also uh, on the bleeding edge of developments for the component model. Uh, the next generation Python support is what I'll be talking about later. Uh, uh, Guy's work on JCO and Commoditized JS is what we're hoping to base the next generation spin JavaScript SDK on. Uh, and then I've also talked to a, a few of you about uh, the future of the JVM family of languages on WebAssembly. Uh, that one's still a little bit more up in the air. I gave a talk last year at, at WASM Day. Um, uh, it's, we can talk more about that later if you want to, but uh, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of dynamics going on there. Uh, and then unofficially, people have written spin apps in a variety of languages, both obscure and popular, uh, including Swift, Zig, Haskell, uh, Idris, what have you. Um, uh, anything that can target WebAssembly potentially could run on spin, uh, depending on how much work you want to put into it. Uh, and then hopefully some of those, those SDKs will graduate to official status. Uh, and then finally, spin hosting options. You know, uh, WebAssembly, the big, the big tagline is it scales to zero uh, and it can scale way up as well. So you can run it on Kubernetes. There's a variety of options. There's Container D shim. There's a uh, KWASM. Uh, AKS has uh, built-in support for it. 
Um, you could run it, bring your own orchestrator, uh, whether it's distributed or local, uh, like no matter system D. Uh, you could even run it on a single board computer uh, in a, lying in your closet. Uh, so uh, you, know, it, you, you choose your, your own adventure there. Uh, and then finally, if you don't want to mess with platform engineering at all, at any scale, uh, you, you can run it on Fermion Cloud. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned uh, that you know, we, we really feel that WASI um, Cloud Core is a great fit uh, and a natural fit for SPIN. Um, we've actually supported the component model and thus WASI Preview 2, uh, things like file system access and so on. Since SPIN 1.1, I say support because it's unstable. Uh, you have to make sure the versions line up uh, of all your tools. Uh, once it releases, we will uh, we'll make a spin release that actually is stable. Um, and we've done some also some experimental uh, work that we're going to demo here today, uh, implementing WASI HTTP, key value, and messaging, uh, and wrapping all that up into a nice little uh, web crawler demo. Uh, and then all this stuff exists in a fork right now because it's just everything's changing so quickly. Uh, but as it stabilizes, we will merge it into upstream spin. Uh, and then one, this is my last slide. The last thing I want to mention is the state of asynchronous WASI. Um, uh, this was alluded to in a few different presentations, including Luke's uh, yesterday, which is that the, the state of WA, uh, WASI asynchronous uh, and concurrent IO is not where we want it to be, but it's actually surprisingly uh, uh, straightforward for some languages. Any language that has uh, languages that are based on essentially stackless coroutines uh, that use this async await syntax uh, with a little bit of glue code, you can create a very idiomatic uh, experience, even with WASI Preview 1, certainly WASI Preview 2. It's going to get even better with Pre Preview 3, but I don't want to scare people off and think they can't do concurrent I.O. We'll show you it can be done, it can be idiomatic, uh, but uh, Preview 3 will make it composable. Uh, and then for languages that are more focused on a stackful coroutine model, such as GoRoutines, the new Java fibers, uh, it's a little bit more awkward. You have to have the, use this inscript and asyncify transformation. Uh, again, that should be eliminated, uh, and you'll have fully idiomatic native support in Preview 3. And with that, I'll hand it back to Joe. All right. It's time to sh see a demo. Um, if you want to uh, see the source code, I have a QR code here. Let me switch to here. So the demo uh, we did with Spin and Wazi Cloud Core is a web crawler. Um, if you don't know what web crawler is, uh, it's a cron job that kicks in when you give a URL and they fetch the HTML from that URL and find all the other URLs in that HTML and then recursively going to fetch uh, crawl the the, or the web, website that can be reached from the single source you provided. All right, I'm going to make this. Is this good enough, for folks? All right. So um, the web crawler application is targeting a crawler world. In this crawler world, we are implementing a message producers and that allow you to send messages to a broker. We are importing outgoing handler, which allow you to do outbound HTTP requests. We are importing YZ key value read write interface. We, uh, I just showed you in the previous slides, it has you know, get, set, delete, and exist functions. All of those imports are, well, where are they implemented? They are implementing the host, where in this case is Spin. So we implemented Spin uh, in, a, in a branch that has YZ messaging, key value, and HTTP. This application is exporting a messaging guest which handles a event or kind of like a subscriber and uh, export a incoming HP handler. So whenever there is a request comes in, uh, the handler it, module is going to be filed up. So uh, I want to first run this. This is breaking down into kind of two application, two services. One is called a publisher, and the other one is called a subscriber. The publisher is taking um, Redis address and works as a HTTP server. So it's using the, uh, it's implementing the, the HTTP inbound HTTP request 
So now it is serving on the local host. The subscriber, on the other hand, is implemented by the messaging handler. So uh, it's also using a Red Redis address to listen to that Redis stream. So now both applications are running. I'm going to do a curl. So this curl is going to hit this local endpoint of crawl path and sending the original uh, URL, fermion.com. And what happened is the publisher is receiving this HTTP request and sent a message into the Redis PubSub. So it's publishing message. And the sus subscriber is subscribing to that stream. So it got a message. It getting fermion.com as the first URL and then try to fetch the HTML um, and then find all the links from that HTML. And then it's going to recursively publish events to Redis and receiving those events. So that's why you are seeing, now I got 32 messages. I'm assuming those are 32 URLs at fermion.com and um, still, still going. I want to quickly mention that the entire uh, applications are written in Python. Although I know, you know uh, people love Rust, uh, but to be able to write application in Python componentized with componentized Py is just an awesome experience. I want to quickly show you the publisher code. All you need to implement is a handle function. Uh, you wrap that into a class that inherits a uh, incoming handler class, which is automatically generated. So this is the binding generated from componentized Py. And now the handler function taking a request or a resource and uh, try to return a response. The subscriber, on the other hand, is implementing a messaging guest. So it also uses componentized Py's generative bindings to implement to inherit that class and try to implement a messaging handler. And the messaging handler, uh, you may guess, is going to fetch the URL using outbound HTTP. At the same time, it's also using YZ key value to save those uh, images we get from the URL into a Red Redis store. So you can see here, we're opening a, a bucket and then we are going to set the uh, URL as the key and the content of that URL as a value into the uh, key value store. In this code, there is no specific provider. It's just key value interface. But when we run it in Spin, it knows what kind of uh, providers are we talking about, maybe through a configuration file. All right, that's the demo. And thank you so much. Any questions? No. Yeah. So, um, this looks, uh, what, the motivation for this is quite similar to the one in one cloud. So, you know, uh, separating of the, the business logic and the providers. Mm. Uh, a big difference, as, as I see, is this, that in, in one cloud, the providers, they run on, they can run anywhere. So, so they can run how it is in, in your case. Do the providers run, what are they required to run? No, they shouldn't be uh, required. I mean, speaking of Fermion Cloud as one implementation, I mean, you could rebuild something for, like Fermion Cloud, but you know, th that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, no, we, we and any given application is generally on uh, at least two nodes, uh, if, if not more, and uh, we're actually working on geographic distribution and you know, smart routing uh, that way, more of an edge uh, approach. Uh, but yes, the, the idea is that, you know, part of the appeal, of course, of serverless types of computing is that, uh, you know, the state lives in the key value store, et cetera. And so having uh, the same app concurrently deployed to a variety of nodes is, is the intention. So 
So um, I showed the interface for YZ key value, and if the business logic is targeting YZ cloud core, it can use the key value read write interface as a library. So where is that library from? It's being generated by uh, two chains like WeBangen. And so when it's tried to call like a get and set function, it's actually making a function call in the module. Yes. yes, and then that makes a, if, it, if it's a Redis backed uh, a key value git, say, then that would cause a network, you know, using the Redis protocol, a network request to the Redis server. Yeah, the Redis server can do that in Redis, but the yeah. okay, but provider can also provide a name space in the same way. Yes, correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Great question. Yeah, the vision is that eventually these popular HTTP client libraries uh, and, and, and uh, socket libraries would be, just, just as we expect that socket libraries would be uh, usually built in the standard library of your uh, programming language of choice, would be implemented in terms of WASI sockets. Likewise, HTTP libraries, we'd ideally like to see them ported to WASI HTTP and be using that instead of sockets. Um, yeah. Correct. Yeah. It. it yeah. It, 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 it comes down to what kind of host you're trying to target. Is the host kind of more low level and it wants to provide you sockets and not and not provide you HTTP? In which case, yes, you'd want to. But you but you had a component that wanted to speak HTTP. Then that's where uh, Luke's kind of uh, style of virtualization would come in, where you'd have an HTTP to sockets adapter essentially that would ins be inserted between your application component and your, uh, uh, the host, if that makes sense. And I want to follow up really quickly. Um, at Microsoft, we developed a runtime called Slide. And Slide is also targeting, implementing the host side of YZ Cloud Core. And we have AWS DynamoDB and AWS S3 targeting YZ key value. So that's more like a directed approach the host is using AWS SDKs to talk to AWS services that implements the host side of YZ key value. But those are transparent from the guest side. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>